This is the Adopted Mom Podcast. Adoption may look different for each family, but we need solidarity from other crazy people who took this leap. And that is what we do here. We encourage, we build up, we share the wins and losses. We lean on each other and we get through this together. Thanks for joining us. Hello, AMP fam, and welcome to season three, episode four. Today, I have a little bit of a different episode for you guys. I know that a huge population of our adoption community have stories of loss and of heartbreak that maybe preface their final adoption story or they like ring true for them currently. I never want any adoptive parents to feel left out of this podcast family, so I knew that I needed to make sure that you guys' stories were represented here too. So that brings us to Kristen Comston. She and her husband are like many of you whose nightmares of failed adoptions came true. What I love about Kristen is that she's not like years removed from her story. This was recent enough that the sting is still very present for her family. Um, I'm so appreciative of how open and vulnerable she was willing to be for us in this interview. And I hope that you guys listening can give her some me too's on social media and in your podcast reviews. You can do that on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. They're really going to help get this podcast into more ears that need it. It helps us be suggested on iTunes to people who are searching for adoption podcasts or parenting podcasts or anything like that. The more ratings and reviews we get, the more that that's going to be suggested. So thank you guys for doing that who have already. And if you haven't, hop over there now. You can do it while you listen. Before we jump into our chat, I wanted to remind you guys to join the AMP community in a couple of different ways. If you haven't found the podcast or me personally on social media, do it now. You can find the podcast and me on Facebook and Instagram. And if you give us a follow, you'll be able to keep up with new episodes, resources, and events as they happen. Another great way is by signing up for the email list. And thank you so much for the people who have already signed up. It's so fun connecting with you guys. But this is going to give you quick access to special links, resources, and updates directly in your inbox every Monday morning. And you can jump on that by heading to theadoptivemompodcast.com slash email. That link is going to be in the show notes. But if you're on the show notes, you can also just click one bar over to the tab that says email. It's really easy. And I think that's it for housekeeping. So let's go hear from Kristen. All right, guys, welcome to the Adoptive Mom Podcast, and today I'm sitting down with Kristen Comston, and I'm always so excited to talk to people who I've never met in real life because I feel like I get to know you so much better. So with that being said, welcome, Kristen. How's it going? Good. So tell us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, uh, like you said, my name's Kristen. I live with my family in uh, Colorado outside Boulder. Uh, My, Yeah. That's I'm a social worker. I work part time and I have three kiddos. So we and my husband and I, you know, make it through day to day. Yeah. Lead this crazy life. <laughs> what does he do? Yeah. Uh he is I need like a quick elevator pitch for what he does. He <laughs> works for Twitter. What? Um, and he does like business uh data business management. That's a lot of big words. Uh-huh, I sure, heard Twitter sure and something about business. I'll take it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's super that's cool. A, I mean, I like the Twitter. That's so. what I understand. Yeah. Hey, that's cool. Um, so you guys are an adoptive family, and but mm-hmm. not all of them are adopted, correct? Correct. So what, um, what's just like the overview? How many, how many are adopted and how many are bio? Yeah, we have three daughters, uh, two bio and one who was adopted. So they're nine and seven are two biological kiddos. And then our youngest is 11 months. And we adopted her. That's so fun. And so you, you know, the the reason you're on this episode is really to talk about um, some disrupted adoptions stuff. And it's not it's not a super pretty story, right? (laughs) Right. Um, and I think that I'm excited to hear your story because I think it's going to resonate with so many people who have been in these situations. And, um, the amazing thing is, I mean, yours, yours did eventually end in adoption, but there was, there was so, such a difficult time in between where you didn't really know what the, the ending of that story was going to be. And so Mm -hmm. I'm so excited to chat with you about, uh, just your faithfulness through that. And so, yeah, just start at the beginning for us. Yeah. Happy to, um, 
So my husband, Stephen, and I had talked about adoption for, I think when we were engaged, we had said, hey, what if our family, you know, grows through adoption one day, which is, uh, you know, much easier said than done. <laughs> so yeah. like eight years later or something, right. we started pursuing adoption and ended up choosing to pursue domestic infant adoption um, and specifically um, ICWA adoptions. My husband is a uh, registered member of uh, the Cherokee Nation. And so Native American babies can be um, hard to place in forever families because Native babies have to go to Native parents mm -hmm. uh, because of the Indian Child Welfare Act. So we um, worked with an agency in Oklahoma who does all sorts of uh, domestic infant adoptions, but it's Oklahoma where there's just a large population of Native American people. And so there are uh, a lot of Native American adoptions that happen there. So that's sort of how we chose to, you know, to land in domestic infant adoption. And let's see. So we, it had probably been a year or so in, into the wait um, oh, the other thing I was going to say was we knew that uh, ICWA adoptions are high legal risk. Mm -hmm. And so we we sort of went in knowing that. Yeah, uh, I was about to say, I mean, that's the ICWA stuff is really controversial and it's hard to navigate mm -hmm. through. And there's so much even I mean, if you were just to type that in in Google, you'd have a bajillion <laughs> news articles. And so walking yeah. into the fire like that takes some I don't take some bravery. Yeah, well. Thank you. I don't know if we, if that's what we would have known when we started this yeah. journey, but <laughs> uh, yeah, there's some special protective factors for Native American kids because they've been um, exploited in the past. And so there's some laws now that give them extra protection um, and extra people that can step in and, and disrupt an adoption. Mm -hmm. So we, um, let's see, last January of 2017, so like a year and a half ago, we were getting into bed and Stephen's phone rang and he answered it and just sort of stood frozen in our bedroom. And I sat up and I was like, this is it. This is the call. Like I just sort of, it, it was, it was just sort of evident from how, how startled and frozen he was. And so he got off the phone and said, there was a baby girl born this morning and they picked us. We need to go to Tulsa which is a 10 hour drive from where we live. So, uh, that was exciting. We'll say, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't sleep at all that night. We like packed bags. I went to Walmart and bought a car seat, um, and then bought plane tickets. And so I left, I was on a plane at seven the next morning. So when our older girls woke up, Stephen told them, you know, we were matched and, you know, mommy's in Oklahoma and they got in the car and they started driving. So I flew into Oklahoma, um, to Tulsa that next morning when the little baby, she was a little girl, was just a day old and met her and her birth mom. And I mean, it's such a crazy experience. Like, let's see, it was maybe like an eight or 10 hour uh, time amount of time that had elapsed and I'm sitting here with this baby like naming her with her birth mom it it happened really really quickly and yeah. so um it was overwhelming to say the least uh but beautiful and heartbreaking I mean there's no other experience like sitting with a woman in the hospital room and then you leave the the room with her baby yeah it was both full of joy and grief. So we had those intense experiences. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's, I mean, that's, it brings to, uh, I don't know, just a reality. You, you hear that adoption is born of brokenness. And I think that that feels like an idea that's, you know, up in the clouds somewhere. But when you're in that situation, you live it. Right. You're saying this is something beautiful that's coming from something so broken. Exactly. Yeah, I cried as we walked out of the hospital with the baby. And that's not how I had expected to feel in that moment. And we're leaving with the baby we've been waiting for. And I was just a mess. Mm. Um, I think I mentioned I'm a social worker. I work part time. I'm a, a therapist and a clinical social worker. So I 
work primarily with folks in the criminal justice system who struggle with addiction, Mm -hmm. um, as well as trauma and mental health. So just, you know, lighthearted days at work (laughs) doing therapy with those folks. Uh, So I just mentioned that to say, I'm, you know, I'm, I kind of know what I'm looking for as far as people that are healthier versus less healthy on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And this birth mama was so sweet, but was really evident to me that there are some big issues. Um, And that was just, just sort of clear to me. So over the next couple of days that sort of unfolded, we had learned a little bit about her medical history that she had some pretty severe, um, some pretty intense uh, mental health diagnosis as well as some, what appeared to be like some developmental delays Mm -hmm. or just sort of lower functioning. Uh, So she was hard to read and sort of hard to try and build a relationship with, you know, for anybody out there who's uh, had a domestic infant adoption and it's a drop-in situation like this where they call and the baby's already born. It feels sort of like an arranged marriage. Like you're in this intense relationship and you've never met. So you're trying to build a relationship with birth mom or birth family And it's just crazy. They've just given birth. They're full of hormones. They're experiencing an intense loss. Um, So I was trying to build a relationship with this birth mama, and it was just difficult. Uh, There were some barriers to sort of getting in touch with her emotionally. So we, it took about, so because um, this was an ICWA adoption, there's a mandatory waiting period before a birth mom could sign um, the relinquishment papers and before we, and that has to be done before we could start the process to leave the state. So we were staying in Oklahoma and Stephen had to decide to come home. We decided that our big girls need to go back to school because, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, kids have to do that as they do. <laughs> yeah. So he went home uh, with our older girls. They drove back home and I was staying there with the baby and sort of trying to build a relationship with this birth mom, but it was, just a real, it was a struggle. Um, she was pretty distant. And a few red flags sort of popped up for me, but nobody else was saying anything about them. So I kept pretty quiet. Mm. Just, just some things that were just sort of in my gut. Like this is not, she's not being honest. Um, oh, and the other, and when we would visit her, the few times that she that she did visit with us, she would say things like, are you sure you want her? Because I'll take her back. And I thought, that's just a weird thing to say. Yeah. Um, but nobody else thought it was that odd. So I just went with it. And there was another thing or two, I can't remember now, that I just thought, that's that. there's a little something that's off here. Um, so we progressed for about a week and a half. And then Stephen had gone home with our big girls and I got a call from our agency and said, Hey, birth mom called the lawyer and asked, you know, she has some questions about, uh, you know, changing her mind, which is. That's the call you don't want to get. Right. I mean, it's the call. All of us are all those, all adoptive parents are so afraid to get. And, and so I was shocked and cried. Um, my grandma had actually driven up from Missouri to meet the baby. So she was there, <laughs> my grandma and my two aunts. So I wasn't alone, which was a beautiful gift. Yeah. Um, and they are wonderful women of God who could be real and be present uh, when that was happening and not sort of be like, oh, no, no, everything will work out. Um, but that kind of let me experience the the fear and the grief that was starting there. So I... They said, okay, we're going to you know, talk to birth mom, get back in touch with you. Um, and I know that if a birth mom you know, calls and says, no, I've changed my mind. Like, I no longer have any legal right to that child. So at any minute, somebody could call and say, get in the car and take that baby back to her birth mom, which is a, a hard tension to live in mm-hmm. uh, for a couple hours. And I ended up living in it for a couple weeks. So each day, uh, her birth mom would call. Um, and say, I think I just need to talk to a counselor. Let's put it off for one more day. And so she was going to counseling every day and seeing a counselor that our adoption agency um, provides for birth moms. And so each day um, I'd call her after the counseling appointment and say, how was it? Do you want to visit with me and with the baby? And each day she'd say, well, I just think I want to sleep 
you know, think about it for one more day. So that ended up going on for about another two weeks, mm. just each day, not knowing if I'm this baby's mom or her babysitter, which again is a painful tension <laughs> to yeah. live in. Uh, and Stephen had gone back home. So sort of each day we are feeling out, should he stay there with our big girls or should he come back and be with me? Um, so that went on for a couple of weeks. And then the day, um, the court date that birth mom was supposed to go to court to sign the papers, you know, I was thinking if we can, she's not changing her mind. We're getting closer and closer to court. So the day of court came and she said, no, I definitely don't want to do this adoption. I want the baby back. So I said, okay. Um, well, I mean, I didn't say, okay. I sort of slid down a wall and sobbed. Yeah. <laughs> but, but said, you know, okay. Um, and then our agency and specifically the counselor that had been working with her, you know, for the last two weeks said, you know, I, you have absolutely have the legal right to do that, but I have to call DHS because you know, just those concerns that I'd mentioned before were really evident. Right. And so it was pretty clear that a baby wouldn't be safe with her. Um, just, just physically, just, she, she didn't have the capacity to, to care for an infant, a newborn. Um, so DHS was called and they ended up coming over to the Airbnb, uh, where I was staying. Oh, and, and let me backtrack. Stephen had come back into town at that point. Okay. So a few days before I'd called and just sort of broken down on the phone and been like, I, can you please come back? And I have wonderful in-laws who Stephen called, they live 12 hours away and they said, we'll be there tomorrow. Wow. So they drove 12 hours to stay in Colorado with our big girls so he could come get on the plane and um, come be with me. So he arrived the day before birth mom said, I, I want, mm. you know, I don't want to do the adoption which again, in hindsight, is such a gift that he was there and that we experienced yeah. that together instead of apart. Absolutely. Um, so DHS gets called and they came and visited us. They went and visited birth mom. And then DHS called me back and said, I cannot take this baby to this birth mom. Can you keep her for one more day? Oh my so gosh. again, like the back and forth. And they said, tomorrow we're, we'd like to have a meeting with her and we'd like you to come and we'll try and explain to her that it's really unlikely she could ever parent and see if that changes her mind about the adoption. So we, we had packed a bag for her. I had written out instructions of, you know, her eating and sleeping schedule, packed up the pack and play. So we unpacked it all and kept her for another night and went into the, um, you know, CPS, DHS offices the next morning to have this meeting. So birth mom was there and, um, you know, DHS really sort of tried to explain it's really unlikely you can parent. There are going to be a lot of requirements placed on you and you'll have to meet all of those. And even if you meet them, you still not, might not be able to parent just because of some organic, you know, um, functioning things. And I watched her, um, this birth mom who was just full of grief and confusion and it just, it didn't sink in. I don't think she could understand what they were telling her. And she just said, no, I want the baby. I want the baby. Um, so we, this wonderful um, CPS caseworker sort of stepped, asked if we wanted to take the baby and step into her office and um, say goodbye to her, which we were able to do. And so say goodbye to this little one that we had thought was going to be our daughter for um, about three weeks and um, this CPS worker. So again, I'm a social worker. I know all of the things that they're required to do. Um, and she said, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but are, are you people of faith? And we said, yes, we are. And she said, can I pray for you? And so she prayed over us, which was um, really just really beautiful in that moment. Just felt like the Lord sort of telling us, you know, he's got her. So we said goodbye to the baby and handed her off um, and left. Um, as we left, her birth mom came over to me and said, oh, do you want the clothes back that she's wearing? And I said, no, you can keep them. And she was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll put something else on her when I get home. So she still didn't understand that like the baby wasn't going home with her. 
Right. Uh, it just, she, it, she just couldn't, couldn't get it. Um, so we, we went back to our Airbnb and booked flights for the next day and drank a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, and cried. Uh, and in, when we got back to our Airbnb, I mean, we were sort of in shock and heartbroken. It was the day of court. So hope had sort of crept back up in me mm -hmm. that maybe this is going to work after all. Uh, and in that moment, Stephen and I were crying and processing with each other. Um, and Stephen sort of took a minute and said, I think we should just pray, pray over this birth mom and baby. And, and he just prayed blessing over them. And I just say that because I married a real winner. Uh, not everybody in that moment of grief can be so kind and loving and compassionate. Yeah. Um, and then we came home. We came back to Colorado and, and continued to grieve. Yeah. <laughs> and um, again, the caseworker was a different caseworker, but was so sweet and asked the foster mom if she could share our con her contact info with us. So this baby's foster mom sent us like pictures once a month and updates. And we knew that she was safe and she was loved, um, which we loved her. So we wanted that for her. You know, if it was hard to know, like somebody else is going to adopt her. <laughs> like if she's going to end up being adopted, why couldn't we? So those were some hard questions to wrestle through. Yeah. Um, but then we really just tried to take care of ourselves and our family and um, that looked really different for Stephen and I. I think that, you know, I think that it's it's interesting that you ended your part of the story there because for so long that was the end of the story. Mm -hmm. um, you, you said that you and your husband kind of dealt with that differently. Uh, do you mind going into detail about that? No, not at all. I'd be happy to. Um our grief just looked different because we're different people mm -hmm. and the loss we experienced was different because I'd been there and having this intense like bonding time with the baby for a couple of weeks and he'd been back home. And so the loss that we experienced felt pretty different. Let's see. I went to counseling almost immediately because um, I also had to go back to work and I myself am a counselor and I counsel people through really heavy things. So we're typically talking about their trauma, their addiction, um, so I felt like I needed immediately that support, even just, you know, for ethically and professionally, I needed to make sure that I could be dealing with my grief sort of on one side so that I could be a, a healthy professional, <laughs> at least a little bit of the time. Yeah, that takes some um, master compartmentalization. <laughs> yeah. And I have some great coworkers, too. I run a therapy group. And when I got back, one of my coworkers had been covering for me. And the group that I came, I arrived back for, we were supposed to talk about grief. And she was like, don't, don't even attempt to come. Like, I will run this group. <laughs> you can start <laughs> back up next week. Uh, and they sort of let me ease back in, which was really supportive. Um, so I went to counseling immediately. I think one of the biggest differences was that Stephen processed pretty quietly and I wanted to talk. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to talk about what I was feeling and I wanted to talk about the baby. I felt like I'd had a baby and now I don't, but I still wanted to talk about her and see pictures of her. Um, and so that was really different for us. I don't think that Stephen was like shutting down. He was just processing internally. Mm -hmm. So it ended up being really important for us to be able to talk with different people. Mm -hmm. um, and it took a a little while for us to figure that out that we were both carrying such a burden that when we only talked with each other, like we were just trying to carry each other's burden and we were already maxed out. We couldn't yeah. carry each other's. Um, I have a, a good friend, a lovely friend who had experienced a failed adoption through foster care, sort of similar parental rights had been terminated, but then baby ends up 
being adopted by a different family who had um, that child's biological sibling. Mm. And so she was, I mean, the hours that we spent crying together and talking together and processing together and praying for each other. Um, I don't know that at the time we could have called them a gift, but they were. Yeah. Just to be able to know uh, so intimately what the other had gone through. And she's one of the people who didn't say the wrong thing or, you know, the people who are like, oh, well, there'll be another baby that comes along or that's just not what it was. This isn't what it was meant to be. I'd be like, that is not what I need to hear right now. Yeah. Just be like, this sucks. I'm sorry. That's all, you know, say that or say nothing. <laughs> yes, I feel yeah. you. Um, I, I'm listening with such fascination because this is a lesson that I feel like we, our family just learned me and my husband and, you know, statistically so many marriages fail or at, at least struggle through the loss of a child. And that's what this was. This was a loss of a child. Mm -hmm. And even though that's not something we specifically experienced there, there was something that came up recently that we really struggled with. And I think that we, we learned that we could not be each other's rock through that. And that feels so mm -hmm. counterintuitive because your husband or your spouse, it it's your person, you know, it's a person mm -hmm. you're supposed to lean on and learning how to, um, learning to, that it's okay to turn to other people. Um, it's hard. It's a hard lesson to learn. And I imagine that, that, that small thing, or it's not small, but what feels like such a small thing can make or break your healing journey as a couple dealing mm -hmm. with loss. Yeah, it. I don't know why we we were able to figure that out pretty quickly that we needed to be able to talk to other people, and and that was really helpful. There were a few times, um, and we also started out with a pretty healthy relationship, so we were, you know, coming from a, a good place even through this loss. Where I could say to him, like, when I cry and you try and change the subject, I feel I I understand that you're trying to distract me and cheer me up, but what it feels like is that my experience isn't valid and you don't want to hear about it, mm. which are hard things to say to your partner, even though it's true and we grew from it. It just, it's hard to grieve yeah. uh, and to grieve differently and to, to tell each other what you need. And so we experienced a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but counseling was really helpful. Um, I journaled a lot, prayed a lot. Um, I wrote thank you notes to kind of all the people along the road that had been present and had walked alongside us. Uh, I wrote them to the caseworkers <laughs> and then I ended up writing a long letter uh, to the birth mom. I waited a while until I could write her a letter that didn't, um, where I wasn't blaming her for anything mm. and where I wasn't trying to passive aggressively show her that the baby would have been better with us. <laughs> <laughs> so it took several weeks for me to be able to be in that place. Uh, I really was trying to find some closure, um, but do it in a healthy way. And one thing that Stephen and I tried really hard to do was just to be real about what was what was happening. It wasn't this birth mom's fault. She wasn't malicious. Uh, she was a grieving woman who understood to the best of her capacity and and her capacity was was sort of low but she was doing the best that she could mm. she led an extremely difficult life um you know there had been abuse in her past and and even in that dhs meeting where she was you know telling us that she was not going to proceed with the adoption uh people were sort of talking over her and cutting her off and and Stephen like quieted people down and made sure that she had a voice at the table and that wow. she was able to speak. Um, so really trying to keep that in mind that that this was not her fault. We weren't owed anything. You know, in adoption and within the triad of birth family, adoptive family, and the child, we were the most stable people um, with the biggest support system and the ability to understand what was happening. And we weren't the victims. She didn't do this maliciously. Um, we were brokenhearted and, and grieving, but we hadn't been wronged in any way. The world is just messy and adoption is messy. And we knew that. But I think that that was really how we tried to walk through it 
to keep that as our focus, that we were not the center point of this story. We were one of three pieces, and it wasn't anybody's fault. It's not God's fault. It wasn't this birth mom's fault. It wasn't the system's fault. Just there, the world is broken, and that brokenness leads to pain, and it was pain on all three sides <laughs> Yeah, in our situation. But um, that's really how we tried to walk through it. And I think why we could find healing as well. Uh, Blame feels good in the moment. It's a way to take the pain you're feeling and try and put it on somebody else. But blame never brings healing. And we were really intentional about saying we want to to find healing at the end of this. That was sort of the mindset that we that we went through it with. Oh, girl. (laughs) I feel like I just went to church. Like that's such (laughs) profound wisdom. And I. I'm just like, I'm not there yet. Like I'm sitting here like thinking of what I would be doing and how I would be feeling. And it's, it's not that I'll just tell you that much right now. Well, I can, I probably make it sound better than it is. There are certainly some moments where I didn't feel that. Um, but that's the way we chose to act. Mm-hmm. Even though it's not how we always felt. Goodness. So but before we move on, I want to talk about this tension. You know, you've talked about some of the things that you did in that time with prayer and journaling and writing thank you notes, which is really cool. But what was, um, what about just you personally on the inside? What was your, what was your walk with Jesus during that time? What was your, um, your, your motherhood during that time? Cause I know even when I am like hungry, it's hard for me to be a good mom. So I can't, I can't imagine dealing with something like this and being like using your kind words or whatever. (laughs) Um, we had a lot of people sort of alongside us. So there were plenty of, there were quite a few times when somebody said, let me just come take your kids for the afternoon, which was wonderful. Um, but there's sort of a, you know, there's a difference when you're like the mean mom or angry mom or or sad mom. So in that time, you know, my my two daughters that we have were were like a balm for my heart. Mm. You know, they're um, I could hold them, and not that they really let me hold them; they're pretty big, but <laughs> snuggle up to them, and you know, and it brought some some healing there. I think we were probably pretty lax parents. We ate a lot of like cereal for dinner and, (laughs) uh, and I, we cried a lot, but we just kind of tried to do that openly. And when they asked, we just told them like, I'm just missing the baby. Um, and talk with them about that. So trying to walk that balance of being honest, letting our kids see us grieve and hear us pray about it. And we prayed with them for this baby and, uh, and her birth mom. Um, but not asking them to carry it, which is a hard balance to find. Um, their reactions, when I told them what was ha- was happening, you know, the adoption had been disrupted. They were sad, but then both of them, their next reaction was, but this is good. You know, if, if birth parents can parent, that's good. Mm. And so we were just like, you're right. That's, you know, if if families can stay together, they should. And even though it's not what ended up happening, their response was just really sweet. Yeah. So do you still keep up with her? With the foster mom? Or just the baby in general? The, um, I have not as much, which has been a conscious choice. Okay. That she's – so I, I did get a picture of her that her foster mom texted me. Um, probably a little after she turned one, but after her, her first birthday, I consciously chose to stop reaching out and saying, Hey, how's she doing? Can you send me a picture? Um, and that foster mom had been so generous sharing, you know, her time and the milestones and pictures, but it was just me coming to a place where I was saying, that's not my daughter. I mm. can pray for her for the rest of my life, but she's not my daughter and that's okay. And so I don't have to get updates once a month. So I did get a picture of her maybe a month or two ago because she and I have still had to exchange, you know, our name is on all these forms and so stuff like that still comes up. And so she'll have to get in touch with me and be like, what is this? Do you have the phone number for this? What was, you know, this uh, hospital test or something? But for the most part, I don't reach out to her very much. Um, 
anymore. I know that 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 baby is safe and loved and she's with her family. And so it's just, I've had to try and create a boundary there. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I think that um, even though that closure didn't come definitively for you, that maybe it's been more of a process, which is okay. So when we first talked and we had discussed doing this interview, um, it was it was many months ago, and we were kind of in this tension that we were talking about where your story, it, it wasn't over yet, but you weren't sure what the ending was going to be. And while another baby, just like all those, you know, all those friends told you, or not friends, but mm-hmm. just people told you, like, there's another baby, and that doesn't help you in that moment. And there was another baby, but that doesn't negate the first, the, your, your grief. Um, right. But I think it's really cool that now, in addition to your, um, in addition to your first adoption story, you now have another one. And that wasn't Mm -hmm. planned whenever we first uh, talked about this episode. So um, tell us about your, your second adoption story. Yeah. Um, So our our second adoption story is our daughter who's 11 months. So this one has a a happy ending. (laughs) Um, So the, you know, I'm happy to share her story, but I also want to protect it some. So I'll probably be a bit more vague. Uh, it's her story to share, you know, when she gets older and, and we have an open adoption and, you know, I can't tell her story without telling her birth family's story. And that's not really mine to tell, but it looked really similar. So, um, it was another drop in. So we just got a call. They said, there's a baby, another baby girl. Her birth mom has picked you. Can you come to Oklahoma today? So, Talk about some triggers, right? Seriously. Um, so it was so triggering, so scary. Um, the first, with our, our first adoption, even though those thoughts were sort of playing of, sure, it, an adoption might not work out. We know that's a possibility. It's not where we thought we were headed. And then with this one, it was kind of, it just felt so scary. We knew how easily adoptions can, can fall apart and be disrupted. And, um, so it was really triggering. It was really difficult. And so we sort of same thing. I got on a plane, Stephen drove with our big girls. Um, the baby was still in the hospital. And so I spent that next night in the hospital with her. Uh, her name is June. And so we got to name her with her birth mom. And, you know, kind of from that first call and to honestly, things that we're still trying to resolve right now, the mantra in my head has been like, this, this is a different story. Um, you know, just knowing that I'm, I could read into, uh, June's birth mom. I mean, so just really pick apart what she said and how she acted and, uh, if she changed when we were going to meet, just, I was always looking, um, for a sign that she was changing her mind. Um, you know, to be honest, bonding with June was harder. Uh, we knew exactly what it was like to fall in love with a baby and, and give him back. And so it was, it was, we had to be really intentional. Um, and we had to be honest that it was hard, which feels like, you're a bad parent Mm -hmm. to say out loud, like this, I look at this baby and I know what it would be like to lose you. And so I, you know, it, you protect your your defensive instincts. Yeah. Are to protect your heart, which means slow down this attachment. Mm -hmm. So we worked really hard, um, to just attach, um, doing all the physical things. And then I talked with a few adoptive moms who were just honest and were like, it's okay. It's okay that you feel that. Just keep doing all the things you're doing, and and it'll come. Uh, Stephen said that adopting is like moms get to experience bonding the same way that a dad does. Somebody puts a stranger in your arm and says, "This is your child." That's an interesting, and, and you learn to love them. <laughs> so it was a very different experience because we have two biological children, and so you know it's different giving birth versus. Um, someone else putting a baby in your arms. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was a slower, um, 
process, but a very intentional process to attach to June. Um, and then trying to build that relationship with her birth family, with her birth mom. Um, I was really guarded with her. And and I told her what had happened, that we'd had a, a failed adoption. And, um, and I think a week or maybe two weeks after June was born, we, um, the agency that we worked with does group, a birth mom's group every week. So it's a therapy group. And so I was going with her and we would sit in group together and it was wonderful because it forced us to have these intentional conversations. Yeah. And so it was in that group. She said, I think that you're afraid that I'm going to change my mind and I'm not going to. And, and she said, I think you need to hear that. And I was like, yeah, I did. I really needed to hear that. Um, do you mind? So it's, can I ask no, how, how old she was? Or um, is? Birth mom? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Uh, she was in her early 30s. Okay. I just didn't uh, know if she was super young or if she was. Mm-mm. Okay. And she um, is parenting a couple kids, so she knows exactly how hard it is yeah, <laughs> to raise kids. Um, yeah. She's just led a, a hard life and wasn't in a place where she could um, raise June in the way that she wanted her to be to be raised. Um, so that relationship was just, you know, it mirrored our other adoption so much mm. that it was, it was just really difficult to be open and honest and be vulnerable, open ourselves up to get hurt again. Yeah. And it took a lot of intentionality. And um, Shelly Jones, who you have interviewed on another episode, I was staying with Shelly at the time. And so just having a person around that I could be really honest with and talk about how scary it was. Um, Cause again, Steven had come back to Colorado with so our big girls could go back to school. And so I was there alone for a little while and then realized this is not healthy. Um, so I ended up staying with Shelly and her husband <laughs> for a couple of weeks. And, I bet you laughed a lot. Oh, of course we did. <laughs> yeah. Um, and June's adoption ended up uh, being really high legal risk. So there was, it actually did come to a point where there was some back and forth and we didn't think we'd be able to adopt her. Mm. Um, and, and that was, you know, when we experienced our failed adoption, we thought, well, at least we won't have to go this through this again. What are the chances this will happen again? Um, and then the things lined up where it really looked like it would. Um, not because of her birth mom, but just because of some other circumstances. June's also Native American. And and so at one point we were ready to to give her back. We we did the same thing. We prayed over her, we put her in her car seat and we drove to to hand her back over. Um we had already brought her home to Colorado. Um and so we, we did it all again. We kissed her and prayed over her and and went to give her um you know, so she could, she could be returned to her birth family. Um, and then there, you know, some circumstances changed and we did end up being able to adopt her. But <laughs> the, the uh, I don't even really have words for that. Yeah, you seem we, like you still are in disbelief <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. And that was several months ago now um, when she was just a couple months old. Um, but just those, you know, I think whether it's your first or your second or whatever number there's of, you know, a disrupted adoption, there's a certain just disbelief of saying, I can't, how can this be happening again? Yeah. Or how can this be happening for the first time? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem like it's what's in the best interest of this child. And again, having to step back into, um, Of, to saying, I'm not the only one who gets to decide what's in the best interest of this child. Um, I'm not that wonderful of a parent where the only way she could be raised well is with me. Um, but it's a heartbreaking and agonizing thing to do. Yeah, well, that's to say goodbye to a baby you love. <laughs> that's so hard because that I mean that goes against every ounce of. It's not even pride at that point. It's just 
it's control, but it doesn't feel like control. You know, it mm-hmm. feels like protection. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be a hard lesson to learn. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay. Uh, when was Forever Day? So it was actually just a, a couple weeks ago, uh, August 17th. We uh, went back to Oklahoma and and had her her finalization. Um, and even though everything, you know, was is really sort of a technicality at that point, no one was still deciding whether or not we were going to be able to adopt her. Um, Stephen and I we were just saying how we didn't realize we were still carrying a weight, um, yeah. carrying the burden of just wondering that little voice in the back of your head of, well, technically. She's not yours yet. Um, so to have that lifted and just to get her birth certificate with our names on it, just things that, that really matter when we've uh, felt like her parents for so long to make it for it to finally be official is a beautiful thing that we celebrated and uh, cried. I cried my way through the courtroom, but... <laughs> I cry through most things, so that's not surprising. Um, yeah, so that was just a couple of weeks ago, and it was a lovely and crazy day. It's a few minutes, and it goes from not your child to your child forever. Yeah. And it's such a, a significant and really quick experience. Yeah, and I think, you know, not I'm not at all, like, trying to – make any of this about me but I just think that it's so cool that like like I said I think we talked in March and as of Mm -hmm. this recording we're recording in um late August right now and it was I feel like so much change and I just got the highlights it was like oh I can't record we might be getting a baby and like oh I can't (laughs) record we are in this adoption process and now we're recording and your adoption just happened. And I think that that, uh, it's just so cool to have been able to like, cause I, I haven't heard the story yet, but to have been able to have known you before and after, uh, is really neat. So, um, before we close out, I have some, uh, final questions for you, if that's all right with you. Mm-hmm. So, um, what would, what do you wish that someone had told you at the beginning of this journey? Um, I, I'll sort of half, half answer that, half put my own spin on it. Um, <laughs> cause I, what I wish I would have been told, I kind of was told and, and that, um, the Lord is making all things new. So in the, you can go through what I thought at the time was the scariest experience, um, the thing that I dreaded and almost had a hard time thinking about because the idea of, of um, having a child and then giving it back, it's just it was my, you know, my worst fear that through that um, – joy and hope and peace can still be present. Mm. It's certainly not easy. And I am not in any way sugarcoating the pain that it is to go through a disrupted adoption. Um, but the sweetness that I experienced from just the presence of the Lord and um, my relationship with Stephen, that in the midst of that intense suffering, there's, um, there doesn't have to be fear. That we can suffer and not be afraid. Um, that you can suffer and still uh, be loving. I guess that's what I wish someone would have told me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's sort of a weird answer to your question. but Very profound. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so what is something that you wish you had done differently? Um. I I think I I um kept a, a lot of people at arm's length. Uh the people that were really close to me, I we let in and they sort of 
carried our burdens along with us, but I didn't let many other people in. Mm. Um, and, and I, I wish that I would have been a bit more vulnerable and let people in and been honest about, um, about what we are going through. That's so hard in the moment though, isn't it? Cause you, in your mind, when you're, when you're grieving or when you're just struggling through something, it's like, all you can think about is, I mean, it's kind of like when you're pregnant, you know, you don't want to tell anyone at first because mm-hmm. if something happens, you're just adding up how many people you then have to follow up with. And, um, yeah, I imagine that that would have been really hard to, um, yeah. And right at first, everybody knew that we were struggling, but, um, I'd say it probably took me a good six or seven months to not to say that it was resolved, but to begin to feel like myself again. Mm. Um, I still cried when I was alone in the car. Every time I took my kids to school in the morning and I cried the drive back for six months. And so those pieces in the later months, I think I are where I wish I would have been more open. I think only Steven and like one close friend, one or two knew that it was still that hard several months later I think people assumed like well you had it for three weeks you should be over it by now and I wasn't yeah. <laughs> I mean yeah goodness um okay what is one specific way that your tribe really supported you through this mm. maybe through both experiences <laughs> yeah um yes one thing one specific thing comes to mind. Um, the the baby that we did not adopt um, on her first birthday, uh, one of my friends showed up at my door with a cupcake with a candle in it. And mm-hmm. she just, um, I just felt seen and felt known. And we, and at that point we actually had June. June was just a few um, weeks or months old. So I wasn't in that intense um, sort of phase of of suffering and struggling, but just that my friend remembered the date and and that it was going to be on my mind that day. Um, it was a I don't I felt so loved and so known. Um, so that was sort of with our with our failed adoption. Um, with our adoption of June, the day that we got that call. Uh, again, and had all sorts of uh, fear and hope and excitement. Two two couples, two families that we know came over, and literally, like, I was almost like debilitated with fear that first day. So they literally like packed my bag, uh, booked me a flight, booked an Airbnb so I had a house to stay in when I arrived, and then drove me to the airport. So they were just present when we needed somebody to be. They went and bought groceries for the car trip so that Stephen could drive um, to Oklahoma. Just showed up when we needed them and like, and just took care of us. Yeah. So I think in both in both instances, it sounds like you had friends that didn't shy away from what might be um, scary or unknown because. Mm-hmm it's so hard to know whether, you know, does she want to see me? Does she want to be alone or whatever? But, but to just have the foresight to say, no, this is, you know, this might be scary or uncomfortable, but I'm going to be there for them. And I think that uh, that's beautiful. That's amazing. So it is, we have good people. Yeah. So on the flip side, I always ask, um, what's something that, that you felt hurt or misunderstood by that Mm. people did. And I think you, you partially already asked, answer that just people saying the wrong things or um, out of discomfort from the awkwardness, just saying something, you know, throwing Mm -hmm. out like some biblical, whatever that (laughs) sounds great, but isn't very nice. Uh, Would you, do you have something else or would that be really it? I think that was the biggest thing. You know, people saying the things that you sort of expect them to say like, Oh, this just wasn't, you know, another baby will come along. Um, Or even once we, we got June. People say, see, this is what was supposed to happen. Um, just sort of like you said earlier, as if that negates the loss that we experience. Mm-hmm. 
and by no means would I change it. I cannot imagine our lives without June. I, she's my daughter. Um, but I still experienced a real loss. So even when we got June, people were sort of like, look, now that other thing didn't happen. Mm. Um, so even just negating it in that, um, and then people just said some really, some really stupid things. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, but I, we don't have to relive the trauma. <laughs> but oh, people. if you're not sure what to say, maybe just be quiet. <laughs> that sucks. I'm sorry is always an acceptable answer. Yes, exactly. Uh, so if you could sum it all up into one piece of advice or encouragement for someone walking through what you've been through or having already walked through it, what would it be? Mm-hmm. Um. It would be um, that your loss is real, and it's okay. I got a text from a woman I've never met. She sort of heard what had happened to us through our agency. She was another adoptive mom. And just sent me a text that said, I've experienced a failed adoption um, and like a a late-term miscarriage. And I can tell you they feel the same. Mm -hmm. So it's like your loss is real. So just validate that whether or not, you know, people are matched during pregnancy and it falls through or, you know, a child that's been, you know, in a foster home for a long time. uh, It's a real loss and and give people time and space to grieve. Um, Because I think the people that really understood me understood that we were grieving the loss of this child. And also I had envisioned our lives together. And so it was this whole future that had fallen into place that we were losing as well. Right. So it's, a, it's a lot, it's a lot to lose. Um, and that, and that's okay. It's a real loss. We don't have to pretend it didn't happen. Yeah. Beautifully said. Um, so where can, where can we follow you guys and, uh, your story and all the, you know, cute pictures and whatnot? <laughs> Yeah, I have a Facebook account. I never use it, so you can go look <laughs> it's at it. Because your husband you works want. for Twitter, right? It, it is. <laughs> that is exactly why. So you can follow me on Twitter uh, at Kristen Compton. Um, and my husband, Stephen, is at Compton. Um, and you can follow him. He tweets a lot more often than I do. Of course he does. Um, and I have, yeah, of course he does. He gets, <laughs> he's like encouraged to tweet at work. Uh-huh. <laughs> And then I, you can follow my Instagram account, which is K Compston. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you yep. so much, Kristen. This was, uh, I mean, I don't want to say this was a lot of fun because your story is so hard, <laughs> but I, it, it's great to hear it. And it's great to hear that. It's great to have that reminder that again, adoption is beautiful. Yes. But it comes from brokenness. And if we don't mm-hmm. honor that, then we're not honoring our children's whole story or any child's whole story um so thank you for for sharing with us today yeah well thank you uh for listening and and for having this as a subject on your podcast uh, it's something that we should talk about yeah. not all adoptions work out Thank you for listening to the Adoptive Mom Podcast. I know this stuff is hard and I hope you found encouragement here. Remember, you are enough and you're doing a great job. God wants to be at the center of this journey and he is big enough to redeem all of our mistakes. Don't forget to check out show notes and other resources at theadoptivemompodcast.com. Thanks again for listening.